the uh, Fujian, and that's the name of the new carrier, which, by the way, is the province across from Taiwan, and I think that's significant. Um, the Fujian uh, looks like uh, the Ford class. It's about the same size. Um, some people speculate it's a little bit bigger than what they announced, so it could be in the 100,000-ton class. And as you point out, it's got some pretty uh, modern things, uh, features to it, including that electromagnetic catapult system, which is now appearing on the Ford class and which, you know, we have yet to get to work well. So, um, you know, China is catching up. Uh, the question is, where did they get that? They probably stole it. Um, and this is uh, to the shame of the U.S. Navy for not protecting its technology. But clearly Beijing is going to use this for nefarious purposes because it does not believe that it is bound by the rules of the international system. It takes a while for an aircraft carrier to work. I mean, imagine how complex it is running a capital ship like that is complex enough than running the air wing on it and having them integrate that. The U.S. has decades, really almost a century of experience in that. Uh, I think China has to learn that from scratch, but I don't see why they wouldn't. I mean, they've been practicing on their previous aircraft carriers, the one they bought from Russia called the Liaoning, if I'm pronouncing that right, pardon me if I'm not, and then the Shandong. So I think they're taking the long view. They know they've got to learn these things and practice. But even if this thing isn't ready for a couple more years, I, I think it's obvious they're willing to make the long-term multi-billion dollar investments to get there. Like, this is as serious as the space program in terms of a high cost, long-term investment. You can't just snap your fingers and get an aircraft carrier. You got to plan that 10, 20 years out. It looks like China's willing to do that. Well, it certainly is. And, and you point out the most important thing about this news, and that is um, the trajectory of China's Navy. Um, they're building capital ships, submarines, and others at a very fast clip. Their Navy is bigger than ours, if you count bottoms. We're still, the United States still has more tonnage, but nonetheless, this is getting to a point where the Chinese um, have a formidable force. And when it comes to, for instance, a war over Taiwan, China will have more assets in the region than we can actually muster. So this shows that China has that determination to take Taiwan by force and also to move against other neighbors, especially Japan and the Philippines. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if China would try to invade Japan or Korea. I find that hard to fathom. But it, I certainly, they have expressly stated they wish to reabsorb Taiwan. It's much smaller uh, uh, population-wise. It's just across the straits. Uh, I think if you plunked a couple of Chinese aircraft carriers between mainland China and Taiwan, uh, I think the Chinese amphibious, I mean, I, I don't want to get too technical. I don't want to pretend that I have a military background, but it just strikes me as sort of obvious. If you deployed the bulk of the Chinese Navy between mainland China and Taiwan, China would pretty much have its way. Uh, and the, and how, I mean, I'm just terrified that the qualitative and quantitative advantages are being lost. Yeah, well, certainly. Um uh, they're being lost. And, and by the way, for an invasion of Taiwan to be successful, China's got to establish an, a blockade. That blockade to be successful has got to include sovereign Japanese territory, oh. uh, specifically Yonagumi, an island which is actually south of Taipei, 58 nautical miles from the main island of Taiwan. On a clear day, actually, you can see the Taiwan mountains from Yonagumi. Huh. And so there's that issue. But also there's the uh, islets in the East China Sea that the Japanese call the Senkakus, right. the Chinese call the Dalyus. The Chinese have a very weak claim to them, um, but they've made it very clear that they're going to take those from Japan. So this carrier, plus the other ones, plus the rest of its navy would be very helpful in uh, taking the Senkakus, the Dalyus from Japan. You know, I was saying earlier, uh, I look at the West's reaction to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And I was checking, and Russia's GDP is almost exactly one-tenth that of China's, and their population is almost exactly one-tenth that of China's. And Russia has oil and natural gas and other minerals, it's true. But most of the stuff we love to buy doesn't come from Russia. I can't think of anything I buy that comes from Russia, whereas I, it's very few things that we don't buy from China, whether it's medicine or 
high tech, anything high tech. And so I look at how difficult it's been to punish Russia economically. The ruble is strong. They, they are not having trouble selling their oil at record prices. I mean, yes, they have had military losses, but I think that the West, has, especially Europe, has been unwilling to pay an economic price for disentangling with Russia. I think of that, and I think that is one-tenth of China's inter integration with the world. And forget about the military hardware. I don't know if the West has the stomach, the moral conviction to get into a showdown with China. I think the West would blink in a second. I'm really afraid that you're right, because as we've seen, um, the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia have been um, less than inspiring. They've been um, they've been somewhat effective, but China uh, China has been able to help Russia to evade them. And the Russians have been very good at being able to sell oil and gas around the world um, to a number of countries, including the United States and the European Union. Um, so, um, you know, China looks at this and there's two big lessons that China takes away from all of this. You know, there's a lot of wishful thinking and, you know, people say, oh, you know, China's seen the heroic resistance of the Ukrainian people and worry that Taiwanese would be uh, heroic. Well, yes, the Taiwanese would be heroic, but that's not the lesson that I think Beijing takes away. They take away two of them. One of them is about the um, sanctions not being effective. And I think you're right. They believe that no one's going to impose sanctions on China. And the second lesson goes to your first point. And that is that uh, the United States, the European Union, 27 nations, and Great Britain, those 29 nations had an economy that it was 25.1 times larger than Russia's in 2021. And yet we failed to deter that invasion, which most people thought was unthinkable. The Chinese look at that and say, well, if the much stronger West couldn't stop Russia, how are they going to stop us? Mm -hmm. And so therefore, this has been a breakdown in deterrence. That was an excerpt from my daily TV style show called The Ezra Levant Show. Each weekday, I do a monologue on the news of the day, then I interview a fascinating guest. I read some fan mail or hate mail, depends on which I like more, and we end with a video of the day. You can get it all at rebelnewsplus.com.